Good morning. Today we're continuing our traction series where we're discussing with thought leaders the various aspects of the traction family of books, including EOS, Rocket Fuel, and Traction. Last week I hosted Mark Winters, co-author of Rocket Fuel. We talked a lot about the visionary and integrator relationship. Today we're going to dive into traction and EOS world with Damon Neff who is a certified EOS implementer and author of X Formation. If you're into traction in EOS or you're simply interested in growing an entrepreneurial business, this is the series for you. Damon Neff lived an entrepreneur's life for over 20 years and now helps entrepreneurs and the companies that they lead achieve strong results. Damon is currently an EOS implementer and an interim executive. And through his consulting firm, CXO Service Company, he has served as a mentor, coach, and confidant to hundreds of business owners. Previously, he was founder of and CEO of Disk Nation and then Store Forward Distribution Service. Damon holds an undergraduate degree from Bryant University and serves on multiple boards. He's an active mentor in the Austin chapter of the Entrepreneurs Organization, and he and I are both mentors at SKU, the Consumer Package Accelerator here in Austin. Currently, in addition to EOS, he provides interim and fractional executive leadership to companies in areas of enterprise technology, organizational alignment, process innovation, and overall operational excellence. Damon, thank you so much for joining me today. Wow, Kurt, what a great introduction. Thanks so much for having me. It's my pleasure to be here. You know, Damon, that operational excellence word is a, a word that I throw around a lot, but it's easy for me to, to, to say and harder to do. Today, we're going to uh, definitely get into some of the, the nuggets of operational excellence. Excellent. I can't wait to talk about that. In addition to the other things, uh, you, you know, you mentioned I'm an EOS implementer and an interim executive. Those are two worlds that pull me in, in different directions all the time because I'm, I'm passionate about both. Awesome. Well, we're going to get on into all that. I want to start with a little bit of a, of a uh, some, some look into 2020 at a high level. Um, and I'd like to start with the macroeconomic environment. Obviously, 2020 has been a shit show in so many ways. And while there are many reasons for optimism, the outlook is just not very clear for 21. We know there's going to be roadblocks ahead. And as you know, we've been a champion for no excuses. We've got to find a way mindset because no matter what the world throws at us, we've got to find a way. You know, when you and I spoke last week, you shared with me a very interesting tidbit. You said you've been impressed with how intact most of your clients' one-year plans have turned out. Despite the 2020 chaos that they've all been handed, most have shifted and pivoted or, or made adjustments and their 2020 numbers are close to plan. Tell me more about that. I thought that was very intriguing. Yeah. So, you know, that's one of the fascinating things about the type of work that I do is I get to get an inside peek at a real detailed level of so many different organizations. And so um, some of my clients are in markets that have literally gone to zero, but that's a pretty small number. I, only two companies that I can think of that I help are in industries that are completely defunct at the moment and may start back up once the pandemic is over. Uh, and I would have actually thought it would be more companies that were in crisis or near zero. And so as I met with my leadership teams um, for our quarterlies, our EOS uh, quarterly pulsing, I was amazed to see that like 80% of my clients had one-year plans that were essentially unchanged. Um, that was a really hopeful um, opportunity and I guess outcome for me. I really expect it was going to be a lot more retrenching. And frankly, when the teams came together, I think they thought that too. And they were really surprised and amazed that the plans they created were still relevant, were largely still on track, and most importantly, were still on attainable, um, you know, with some effort and some focus and some minor tweaks. And of course, I've also had the other opposite, which is I have some companies that are at record volumes, you know, right industry, right place, right time. And, you know, they're drinking from the fire hose and even exceeding their plans, at least from a revenue perspective. We've seen something very similar, both with uh, Hire Better as well as our clients. It's been very interesting to see play out. And we've had to work a lot harder for sure to achieve some of those numbers on the plan, but uh, we, we've made it happen. Hey, we're going to talk a lot about the visionary and integrator concepts. Uh, but as I hear you talk about the plans and the numbers and how, how passionate you were about that, uh, I'm going to assume that you follow more in the integrator uh, mindset, especially since you're into operational excellence. Yeah, you know, so that's a really interesting question. Uh, and yeah, yeah, I would have said four years ago, I would have said you are 100% right. But I took the rocket fuel uh, visionary and integrator assessments along the way, and I was amazed to find that I'm actually more of a visionary. I score high as both, but I'm actually a higher visionary. And, you know, that kind of gave me a crisis of confidence for a minute because I'm like, wait a minute, if I was really convinced that I'm an integrator and I'm great at, um, you know, managing projects through to completion and setting plans and all this, how is it possible that I could score higher as a visionary? So I took a clarity break and I thought about it and it all suddenly made sense to me, which is that the nature of my work. So I work as an interim executive. 
I'm not uh, an executive company's hire uh, full time to be part of their team, being paid by the company as an employee. I'm an outside consultant that works at the top of organizations as a change agent. And so when I thought about the nature of my work, it made perfect sense. My visionary nature drives me through to completion on things so that I can get to the next exciting thing that's burning my mind up. I'm a recovering CPA and I'm also, uh, you know, I'm a big four public accountant. So people think that I'm an integrator. And uh, while I don't really know that I'm, a, I don't feel like I'm a visionary, I definitely am not an integrator. So uh, uh, we'll, we'll get into some of that. Well, as they say, half the battle is knowing that you have a problem, or I would say in this case, half the battle is knowing where you sit, right? I mean, it's not always easy to understand, uh, especially, you know, entrepreneurs face that struggle because when they start organizations, a lot of times it's just a small number of people and they're wearing all the hats, the visionary and the integrator. And as you start to grow and scale, um, I think that's when you have to kind of reach that decision point about which one am I? So I don't think it's that uncommon for people to be either... Um, uncertain about what they are or feel they may actually be the other. <laughs> well, I know that when I read the book, Rocket Fuel, it was it was like a uh, it unleashed me because I was uh, authorized to be who I am and I didn't have to try to overcome the things that I'm not. So, uh, Damon, last week I spoke with Mark Winters, co-author of Rocket Fuel. We talked a lot about uh, what they describe in the book as the visionary and integrator. Um, I'd like to call it an execution partner, operating partner for those who aren't familiar with the EOS uh, system. But let me give you my back of the nap- back of the napkin description of those two, and then you correct me where I'm wrong. Sounds uh, great. A visionary usually has a lot of ideas. Uh, some of them may even be good ones. Uh, they often have very strong relationship skills, and uh, they may have strong sales or business development skills, or maybe even the ability to sell ice to Eskimos or lead the you know team to climb the mountain. But the integrator yeah. is the one who actually makes it happen. They turn that vision into reality. Uh, they're the ones with the plan to scale the mountain, assigning tasks, setting schedules, holding people accountable. Did I get that right? Absolutely. Yeah, you pretty much nailed it. And uh, the thing that I would add is that um, not every company has a separate visionary and integrator. Sometimes that's just one leader, the entrepreneur, typically, or someone like that. Uh, but, the, you know, that's a, a pretty unique skill set um, to be able to both create the vision and drive execution. So the way I think of it is kind of yin and yang, different halves of the same whole, one creating vision and that big context, the other turning that strategy into plans so that teams can take action. I like it. And and one thing that I get, uh, people who aren't familiar with EOS get confused sometimes. We have the visionary integrator. And then on top of that, we have the implementer, which I know you're a certified EOS implementer. Can you give me the 20 second spiel on what that role is and what that concept is? Yeah, the best way to think about an EOS implementer is as an executive coach. So I work with leadership teams. So that would be the visionary, the integrator, and everyone who reports directly to the integrator. And I help them get strong with the EOS concepts because even though what Gino outlines in Traction, um, which is the book that describes EOS, the entrepreneurial operating system, is simple. Creating those tools, knowing if you're using them right, and frankly, just having the will to carry forward a lot of times that's where the coaching aspect happens. So I help companies get strong and be successful with EOS so that they can run their own EOS implementation. So an integrator is leading day to day the company. I'm coaching that entire team, you know, periodically to make sure that they're sticking with the program. Great. Uh, so let's dive into the, the meat of some of that. So I'm a, a visionary entrepreneur and uh, I have uh, finally uh, seen the light and I realized that I need someone to help me make this happen. And so I, I seek uh, an integrator. So two, two mega topics I'd like to go to next. Number one is finding and hiring said integrator. And number two is that relationship working with the integrator for the long haul. So let's, uh, let's start with that. Um, first of all, can we agree that visionaries suck at hiring? Uh, I, I, you know, I, I kind of um, try to avoid blanket statements, but I would say yes. In my experience, I have seen visionaries struggle with hiring, particularly hiring an integrator. And, you know, let's just parse through that dynamic a little bit. So if you have a visionary with one direct report, who's the integrator, and then the leadership team reporting to the integrator, that can feel very kind of lonely, paralyzing, and, and frankly, confusing to someone who's used to being more of a hands-on leader to the team. But the reality is most visionaries create a lot of confusion, you know, changing direction, um, seeing different things that need to be executed on that may or may not be ready. 
um, maybe not understanding the trade-off between abandoning things we're executing and shifting to something else. That's why the integrator is so important because they can balance that person out. But the challenge is building enough trust and cohesion and health between that relationship where it doesn't feel dysfunctional. And I think that that's what many visionaries go through is they feel like they're losing control. They're not adding value. They're being pushed away from the company. But the reality is, is they're happiest once they can focus on the vision, the big relationships, um, creating, you know, key kind of um, sales opportunities and things that the rest of the organization isn't able to do. But it's a journey to get there. Well, so you skipped ahead to the relationship of the visionary and integrator. So I'll go back to hiring in just a second. But on sure. that relationship. Um, you, you talked a little bit about visionaries feel uh, feeling needed is one of the challenges that they have and also losing some semblance of control. Um, what most people don't understand is, is an entrepreneur who wants to grow and scale. They, they recognize truly, you know, in their heart that they need somebody who does things differently can build scale pro- uh, processes, systems, infrastructure, what have you. So by definition, you're pretty much looking for somebody who can do things differently than you. Right. Yes. And so tell me a little bit about that dynamic. How do I balance that? How do I balance the need and, no, and knowing that I, I want and crave that with the reality that my, my, my uh, business is being not dismantled, but changed tremendously? Yeah, well, um, I, I think it helps to have a roadmap to execute. And, you know, that's what EOS is. You know, I think Gino was so insightful and visionary himself. Gino Wickman, who wrote Traction, is a visionary. Um, by labeling and identifying these two, you know, in traditional corporate parlance, uh, we'd say CEO and president or things like that. You know, Gino just strips away the titles and says, hey, someone's better at vision and someone's better at execution and planning. And a lot of times that's not the same person. So I think the reality and the recognition that there's actually a model that, that you know, many companies, over 10,000 companies are running on EOS, uh, that it's working, but it takes time to adjust and kind of pivot to that. So I think the first thing is the realization that that's what you need. The second thing is, to your point about hiring, finding someone who can do that work. And then the third thing is creating, uh, you know, basically approaches and rhythm that create a healthy relationship between those two. And then, of course, between the integrator and the rest of the team. Um, Because when you think about it, trust is really one of the most important parts of that. You know, I'm not going to relinquish control of my company day to day to someone who I don't trust or who I don't feel has my vision in mind or the same things. And of course, you know, the, the visionary integrator relationship is built on healthy conflict because it has to be. As you mentioned, the visionary is going to have 10 ideas a week. Maybe only one of them is even right for now. And maybe now is not even the time because we're executing other things that we don't want to lose focus on. Visionaries don't tend to see those challenges. They, they see everything as up and to the right right? Everything's better. Everything's bigger all the time. The reality is that only happens if you have great execution. That's an integrator's job. Well, I know it is hard to let go. And and as a visionary who has brought in an integrator and and frankly had challenges in previous years with it, with a different integrator, um, I've now got a a good one in Cisco Sacasa and uh, we're able to balance each other out. One of the beautiful things that I've done is been able to step, I say step aside, not step out, I stepped out of the CEO role even and, and, and given that title to Cisco and he's running day to day. He's running uh, re- really almost everything within the organization other than things like this and, and uh, thought leadership and evangelism and, and working with some of our strategic relationships with clients. Um, that's, that's hard to do for a lot of entrepreneurs to relinquish control and candidly still feel valued within the organization. Tell me a little bit about, and maybe it's in their mind, it's head trash, but tell me a little bit about that, what you've seen in your past. Sure. Well, I, I mean, if you think about it, if we take an even step back from there, there's a, there's a conflict that exists in many entrepreneurial companies, which is the desire to create a great organization that can grow and scale so that you can one day have a successful exit. And the reality that it's going to take a lot of you know planning, execution, things like that to get there. And the company, when you go to exit, cannot be built on and require the special sauce or knowledge or actions of one individual. And that's how many entrepreneurs operate is they keep many things close to them and they do them themselves, not even realizing that may be a barrier to exit later. So we talk about getting the company running like an engine. And so uh, as you were just talking about, like you and Cisco, if you can empower and enable Cisco to be great without needing you, 
what you've now built is something that's um, recreatable, it's scalable, and most importantly, it can be purchased by another entity and not need you to be involved in the day to day. So I feel like many people operate their business with the goal of having some sort of future exit event, but they don't actually build the company that's going to get them there. Yep. I think that's uh, very, very well said. Hey, let's flip back briefly to hiring. Uh, I think we can both agree that the integrator role is probably the most challenging hire for uh, most visionaries. Tell me a little bit about that. And, and not, let's not really look at sourcing or you know, how to find candidates. More about once I found a pool of candidates, uh, what I'm looking for, how I interview them, maybe even uh, what the uh, strategy is for defining the role. Give me your thoughts on that as, a, as an integrator and interim exec. Sure. So what I've seen most directly are um, companies and visionaries burn through integrators, meaning they don't have the right person in the right seat, as we would like to say. And I think the challenge is, from a visionary mindset, you see the promise and the opportunity in many things. You know, I, I'm a visionary. I'm a glasses half full kind of guy, really hard to get me down. Um, but that can that can let you down when you go to hire an integrator or, or a key executive or anybody who's uh, really important in a critical role in your company, because many visionaries see the promise or the opportunity in people, or maybe even are drawn to things that are more like themselves, um, being gregarious, being outgoing, things like that. But the reality is the integrator position is one of execution, of steady state, of control and concern. And a lot of times that doesn't feel natural um, to a visionary. And so you mentioned uh, a lot of visionaries are bad at, at hiring, especially integrators. Um, I have seen that as a continual ongoing challenge. It doesn't mean all visionaries are terrible at it, but I think the times that it becomes an emotional hire or they don't follow a process or don't get others involved, oftentimes that I've seen it just not work out. And that, you know, can create a crisis of confidence, like how am I ever going to find the right integrator when, you know, I've tried once or maybe even twice and come up short. The, the important part is to have the realization of what went wrong, because this is a proven approach to creating a company that can scale. And again, I see visionaries who, when I meet them and they engage me, are really kind of almost in despair or losing hope. And that's why they're looking to EOS to help them. A critical part of that hope and help is finding a great integrator. Well, I've got two pieces of advice for the uh, visionaries out there and, and for the integrators. For the visionaries, uh, uh, it's hard to, um, it's definitely a hard hire. And uh, 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 don't just hire the friend of a friend. That's where oftentimes that mistake happens or they yep. someone recommends them. Run a process. And uh, what I, one of the common mistakes I see from visionaries is allowing their team to make, to, to interview said integrator. And uh, that's, a, that's a challenge. It's hard to hire your boss. Most of these yeah. folks have been reporting to you. You're probably not great at, at accountability and management, so they tend to get away with some things. With an yeah. integrator, they're going to hold them accountable. And so uh, I would encourage you not to have them interview direct, directly because of that, um, but you might allow them to have some uh, you know, social interactions or go to dinner together or what, whatever. But you may want to have a, a, a coach or advisor or mentor be part of your interview team, someone who sees your blind spots. Somebody like Damon, if you've got Damon involved, of course, uh, you know, any uh, somebody with strong integrator tendencies that can be, be counterbalanced you during the interview process. Yeah. Well, I think that's great guidance. And, and what I say to people, um, and, and some of this is my now bridging into my personal philosophy versus maybe pure EOS. But, um, you know, when I give people, when I, so I've run five companies, when I give people promotions, they've already earned the job. And that's frustrating for some people. They want the promotion early. They want the pay raise now. They're going to prove they can do it. That's never been a winning model for me. And the same thing goes for hiring, especially an integrator. They've got to have been there and done that for me to hire them. Um, if they're talking about theory, what they might do, if they've never been in that role before, especially if maybe they're coming out of maybe sales and marketing and maybe not operations, which is kind of more of an uh, integrator type mindset. Those are all red flags. So, you know, that's one way that we can also put guardrails up is hire people who've run an organization where the leadership team reported to them. I mean, that is uh, and make sure that they did a good job and that they can talk about their accomplishments as well as their struggles or what they may do differently. But at the end of the day, you've got to convince me you've already done it. I love that. As an as a entrepreneur and visionary, I want to see the promise in you. And I believe that you can do that. And I'm probably going to fail uh, with my first integrator if, if that's my approach. But I love the fact that you're bringing in somebody who's been there and done that. Uh, a word of advice for integrators, uh, especially, uh, well, all integrators, when you're, when you're coming on board, 
sometimes uh, the, the visionaries want to move very fast and get you just charging on whatever those new projects are. And you may want to prove yourself. I'm really going to encourage you to take your time, get to know the organization, get to know the, the visionary, get to understand the way things are done. Not because you, that's the way you're always going to do them, but it just allows you to uh, build a relationship with the team before you start making wholesale changes. That will uh, uh, sour your relationship pretty quickly if you, if you try to uh, change everything right off the bat. I don't know how you feel about that, Damien. Yeah. Well, I, I think one of the things you're talking about is, you know, the reality that you have to be able to work with people and, and the visionary and integrator in particular, if you don't have good chemistry from the get go, pretty unlikely it's going to get great. Um, so I think in the beginning, you have to feel like you could work with this person. Um, if you're sitting in the integrator or potential integrator seat and you don't understand the vision, that may be difficult because it's your job to translate that into plans so that others can take action. Um, if you think this person is completely unreasonable or unhinged and you can't work with them, that's going to be a barrier. Um, so, you know, I think just like with anything, you have to see a path to daylight and feel like you could be successful in that. And then it's really uh, about those small things. Um, so like one thing that we talk about in EOS is having same page meetings where just the visionary and integrator spend time offline together working on their issues. And their issues could be personality or things like that. But most important, usually it's more like top level company business. Again, that's not ready to share with the rest of the company because it might be too soon or too threatening or, you know, blow their minds or whatever. That's where you're getting that healthy tension and that pushback. Um, But if I may, you know, one other important, critically important part when we're talking about hires is right people. So in EOS, we say you've got to be the right person, meaning you're a core values fit, and you've got to be in the right seat, meaning you can get, want, and have the capacity, the skills, and time to do the role properly. So a lot of times when I see um, you know, conflict or things like that, it's that we didn't hire the right person. If we hire someone who's a great core values fit, then that's going to solve for a lot of things and allow us to put emotion aside and really focus on the role at hand. Well, uh, very well said, and I like the uh, the right person, right seat approach. Hey, let's shift gears slightly, but really on the same uh, similar topic, and that's the, the concept of, of interim executive leadership. I think it's an underplayed uh, op- opportunity out there for, for companies, especially if you can't afford or, or, or uh, you don't know what you need uh, long term. You've yeah. made a career out of that at this point. You've written a book about it, uh, Exformation. Tell me a little bit about uh, what you think about interim executive leadership and how it can benefit organizations. Yeah. So, um, you know, based on what we've already said, uh, what, what I share with people is I really do two different types of work that are that are the same in nature. I help companies get better. So for companies that are looking just that have a leadership team and they just don't know what to do or they feel like they're not getting their best results. That's where EOS works every single time. On the interim executive side, that tends to be where companies don't have the talent or maybe have outgrown someone in a leadership position and need new perspectives, new ideas. So an interim executive steps into a company as an outsider, essentially works as an executive level consultant. So I'm not an employee, but I have all the same power and authority as if I were the, the, an employee in that seat. So I, I can hire, I can fire, I, I spend mon- money within my budgetary authority. So it's just like I was a full-time hire, except the difference is I'm not, and I'm also there to make change. So many people think an interim executive might be like, oh, well, you know, we just lost our head of sales. Let's just put someone in that seat to kind of keep the steady state going. That's not traditionally a great use for an interim executive. You know, I'm kind of like, you know, a, a caged lion, if you will. Like if, if there's no change on the table, I'm not a good solution for an organization because I'm there for change. I need to eat meat, if you will. And if that's not happening, it's not interesting to me. There's no real um, great results that are going to manifest. And ultimately, I might not be a great solution for that company. So interim executives are all about finding knowledge. I call it specialized on demand senior level talent for an organization with some particular goals in mind that that person's tenure is going to accomplish so that when we get to that state, we can help the company hire and backfill and put a permanent person in that seat. Well, uh, again, very well said. And, and of course, hire better is the, uh, the way to go for all of those uh, uh, interim and permanent needs, right? 100%. Yeah, I mean, you guys are are great. And you're one of the few companies out there that are actually talking about interim executive leadership in the way that I speak about it. Um, And like interim execs is an association of people like me. Um, You know, that's what that's what we talk about is the fact that we have to create awareness about what interim executive leadership is so that more companies can benefit from it. 
and you know, like uh, people may say, well, I don't even understand what this means. So let me just give you, you know, kind of a real world example. A lot of times I'm a one or maybe two day a week chief technology or chief operating officer for a company. And so they may say, well, how could you possibly do the job in one or two days that would normally take someone five days to do? And the reality is, you know, I have a lot of experience in cycles. I've been working as an interim executive since the 90s, leading change at companies as large as multi-billion dollar household names and as small as startups. And as a result, I'm, I'm, I'm probably more efficient and I certainly have more cycles in different environments than most traditional leaders. So what I'm kind of doing is packaging up that value to lead my team through change. And really more than a one or two days a week with me for a small company, I can outstrip my team's capacity to execute. So really what I'm doing is creating higher level context, bringing tools and practices that they may not know, coaching up my team and getting them cranking on things so that I can be there one or two days a week, deal with the issues, keep the, key, uh, keep the team cohesive and really make sure that execution is happening but the results should be no less than what you would expect with a full timer and maybe even greater. It, it sounds like you remove a lot of the drama uh, from this situation and you bring experience and, and just, uh, uh, just operational excellence. Well, I try to, I mean, removing drama is, is a tricky business. Um, but you know, like we like to say, our job is to enter the danger. And frankly, that's, that's also as an EOS implementer, you know, when I'm facilitating sessions with leadership teams around EOS, I have to be able to call out the elephant in the room or go to painful issues that the team might not be, you know, kind of willing to address on their own. Same thing with interim executive leadership. You know, I have to be able to speak truth to power. If we're going to work on something, I have to see the path to success. And ultimately, that's how I'm helping coach and groom the folks around me and under me. But yeah, it, sometimes it can be emotional, but I'm always... Uh, kind of just the facts, ma'am, in my approach. You know, I want to know what we need to do, how we need to do it, and can we all see what success looks like? A lot of times just having that presence and that strong leadership will help people spin down and focus on the change at hand because I'm bringing been there, done that approaches that I, I believe fully will work and my history shows do work. Well, I can tell you most entrepreneurs need exactly what you're uh, prescribing there. Hey, Damon, let's, uh, I don't know how much time we've got left, maybe five more minutes. Let me, let me go through a couple of other uh, questions I like to ask. So I've got a couple of uh, personal questions for you. The first, actually, the, my main one is tell me something about you that we wouldn't know from reading your LinkedIn profile or your, your website. Well, I think you get a clue to this reading my LinkedIn profile, but people ask me it all the time. So people ask me, are you a disc golfer? Do you play Frisbee golf? Because my wife and I own the world's largest retail company in that space. Absolutely. <laughs> and in fact, I just spent a weekend with my best friend, Dave. He taught me how to Frisbee golf back in the 80s. And uh, that was uh, the genesis for our business. You know, we saw a huge opportunity in a high growing sport where there weren't many shiny operators. And that was why we started Disc Nation was to turn more people onto the joy of that sport. So, uh, you know, a lot of people ask me, do you actually play disc golf? Yes, I do. And then they ask me, you must be like a pro. You must be that great. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm, I'm a recreational player like many of our customers or past customers because we sold that business. Um, but I love the sport. I think it's great for everyone. It's easy to play. It's low cost. Uh, you can play for free at many parks. And there's thousands of courses across the country. Well, I've always enjoyed it every time I've played. My oldest son and I used to have uh, some, some uh, good back and forth uh, battles on the disc golf course. Excellent. We should all play sometime. I love it. Let's do it. Hey, uh, Damon, anything else you'd like to add before we part? Um, just one thing. Uh, so you mentioned my book, Exformation. Um, really what it's about is um, the book has three sections. What is an interim executive and my, why might a company want one or consider one, which I think is really important, especially now, you know, the ability to find on-demand talent that addresses your specific needs quickly. Um, it, there's never been a greater need for it. And I don't know that everybody really thinks about that opportunity. Um, the second section is about how do interims work and how do they get results time after time? You know, as you can imagine, I step into a company pretty cold, not knowing much at all about the challenge at hand other than kind of the basics. So it's kind of mystifying to people how you could create success over and over with those dynamics. That's what the second section of the book is about. And then the third is, if you think you need interim executive help, how do you find it? How do you assess it? How do you get a great interim for your needs? Um, so, you know, I want to share that with everyone just to know, like, this is kind of a uh, an in-depth tutorial on everything about interim, and, I, and it's designed to help. It's not just simply designed to create awareness. It's designed for people who are entrepreneurs who may be having needs in their company. You know, like I like to say to many people, 
marketing these days could literally be a thousand different things. There are so many different ways to market. Every company doesn't have the same needs. So an interim executive that has specialized skills in social marketing or affiliate building um, or influencer marketing or something may be exactly what a company needs that their current leader doesn't have. Um, or maybe they have a hole in that seat or they're just growing into it. So at any rate, I would I, that's one thing I'd want people to know. And, you know, the other is that um, I, I personally am driven as a person by helping other people. Um, that's why, frankly, we don't have the disc golf company anymore is selling products isn't really as exciting to me as helping people. So if anybody heard anything on this podcast and wants to reach out or connect or hit me through LinkedIn, I always make time for people in need. As long as I have time on my calendar, I mentor at different programs around town um, where I don't you know, get any compensation for that other than helping other people. And that's something that drives me as a person and gives me great satisfaction in all the work I do. Well, that's one of the things I like about you, Damon, is that servant leader mentality and the uh, willingness and interest to give back. Um, and uh, we'll make sure we put a, a link to this book in, oh, thank uh, you. in our uh, a chat box on LinkedIn and, and YouTube. And uh, it is a good uh, read about the, the concept of interim leadership because it is very mystical, if you will, to a lot of folks. So thank you for, for that. And Damon, thank you so much for joining me today. I, I really appreciate what you're doing and all the things you just talked about with your, with your servant leader mentality. And uh, you're absolutely making an impact in the entrepreneurial uh, community. So keep up the great work. Thank you, Kurt. It was honestly my pleasure to be here. I really appreciate you asking to be on. And uh, I, I hope that this has been great for your audience. And to all of you, thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back next week with another edition in our series, the Traction Series with EOS and Rocket Fuel. We're going to be visiting with Mark O'Donnell, who's the new visionary at EOS Worldwide. He's been an implementer since 2014. So he has a very unique perspective on the whole EOS landscape. We're going to keep the conversation going about how visionaries and integrators, when they work well together, it's like putting rocket fuel in your jet engine. So, uh, Damon, until next week, everybody, no excuses, stay strong, and let's go.